Good afternoon, everyone. Today we'll provide a brief COVID update with modeling and data from Commissioner Pichek and a health update from Commissioner Levine, and then move to today's press conference topic. Later today, uh, my office will send a list of all the opportunities to be vaccinated this week, because as I've said, we're not letting up on making vaccines as available as possible. We don't want accessibility to be the excuse. There was no White House call today, but there will be one next week. So at this point in time, I'll turn it over to Commissioner Pichek for a quick modeling update. I think it's about two minutes and 27 seconds. <laughs> Uh, thank you very much, Governor, and, and good afternoon, everyone. I'm happy to report that Vermont continues to make progress in its nation-leading vaccination rates. This week, an additional 2,400 Vermonters received their first vaccine dose, increasing the percentage of eligible Vermonters who have started vaccination to 82.8%. That continues to be the highest in the country, and Vermont continues to lead across all other vaccination categories. No matter how you measure it, Vermont remains the most vaccinated state in the country. I'm also happy to report that Vermont was just one of two states that did not report a COVID-19 fatality this week. In, Vermont, in fact, Vermont has not had a COVID-19 death in the month of July, the only state to be so fortunate. And we continue to forecast a very low fatality rate for the foreseeable future. Vermont's hospitalization rate remains the lowest in the country, and we've seen our averages steady out and our critical care numbers decrease over the last two weeks as well. We did see a small increase in cases this week, with Vermont reporting 16 more cases compared to last, but our rates remain in the single digits and also remain the lowest in the country. Our forecast for the next two weeks was revised up a bit as we anticipate a slightly higher caseload largely driven by rising cases among the unvaccinated in Vermont, the region, and the U.S. In the Northeast, cases rose 38% this week, with New York and Massachusetts seeing the largest increases. It's a good reminder that Delta's impact can be seen even in the most vaccinated region of the country, in part because even in New England, there are still 2.7 million individuals who are eligible for the vaccines but have not yet protected themselves. Here in Vermont, we must continue to encourage our friends, our families, our neighbors to take advantage of these life-saving vaccines. And that message is so important with cases and hospitalizations rising in the majority of states across the country. We can see that the risk does, however, continue to remain lower in the Northeast compared to much of the rest of the country. And comparing counties by vaccination and case rates, we can see clearly that areas of the country that have fewer vaccinated people are seeing the highest number of cases. Again, demonstrating the effectiveness of the vaccines and the importance for everyone who can to step up and protect our state. At this time, I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Levine. I'll, <clears throat> I'll keep my comments brief likewise, since as you've already heard, while we continue to have cases, as we've always said we would, overall COVID activity remains low. And our vaccination rate is a robust 82.8% of eligible Vermonters with at least one dose. That amounts to over 455,000 people. So here's what you need to know right now. First, the data shows that all three vaccines work against the variants circulating in the U.S. So if you want to protect yourself against COVID and its variants, the best way to do that is to get vaccinated. <clears throat> Two, the amount of time that protection lasts seems to be quite good, but there's still a lot of investigation going on regarding the immune response, which is a good thing. It's good that the manufacturers and the scientific community continue to research this, and the FDA and CDC monitor and evaluate these studies. The bottom line is there's no evidence that you need a booster at this point, <clears throat> but we will closely monitor any new guidance and let you know if that changes. Likewise, 
if you have an immunocompromising condition, there is no specific guidance yet to receive a booster dose. But there is guidance to consider taking the usual precautions, such as wearing a mask. Thirdly, and for the Johnson & Johnson vaccine specifically, it is effective against COVID and the variants here in Vermont. We don't have any evidence it's handling the Delta variant any differently and are awaiting the publication of more data on its performance. There is no conclusive evidence to suggest that a booster with an mRNA vaccine would be necessary, and this is also under active study. So if you got the J&J &J vaccine, you are still protected. If you are concerned because you are traveling to a state with higher Delta activity, you should consider other strategies, such as wearing a mask. And finally, if you're wondering about your level of protection in general, remember you're even more protected here in Vermont because so many people here are vaccinated. This is the real power of vaccines. They give a virus so many dead ends and stop further transmission and keep us all safer and healthier. This is public health at work and why we will keep working all summer long to get the vaccine in front of as many Vermonters as possible so we all have the opportunity to be protected. Governor? Thank you, Dr. Levine. As we've discussed at many press conferences over the last four years, working to turn the tide on Vermont's workforce and demographic trends has been a top priority of my administration. For over a decade, our population has gotten older, and there have been fewer workers entering the workforce than those leaving it. And as we've seen across the country, this problem has been amplified by the pandemic. But as you've heard me say repeatedly, the problem in Vermont wasn't caused by COVID. That's why we're focused on growing the economy and making Vermont more affordable, while also making critical investments to support our workforce like record investments in housing. We've also focused on workforce development, trying to give Vermonters the tools they need to succeed in the 21st century economy, helping them learn new skills they can use to move up the economic ladder. Today, I'm pleased to be joined by Patty Prelock, the Provost and Senior Vice President of UVM, as well as Joyce Judy, the President of CCV, to announce the launch of the Upskill Vermont Scholarship Program, which is a new career education program benefiting Vermont workers and businesses. The program will help those who want to gain new skills or even try a new career path as we emerge from the pandemic by offering up to two professional development courses in the coming year through UVM and CCV at no cost to the Vermont resident. The courses were selected by UVM and CCV to meet today's needs and help grow our economy. This includes careers in the new digital economy, health sciences and communities, as well as leadership and management training to help workers advance in their current fields. The program will also provide career counseling events over the coming months, where folks will be connected directly with employers and be able to ask questions uh, for places that have hundreds of job openings right now. The funding for this initiative, about $4 million for UVM and the state colleges, was approved by the legislature this year using ARPA funds. And I want to thank them for their work on this as well. As we recover from the pandemic, it's so important that we take advantage of all the funding opportunities that we've been handed to make transformative investments that will help us rebuild stronger than before. Whether it's the billion dollar package I proposed this spring or programs like this, making smart investments in our future that have lasting, long lasting benefits. And it's what we need to do. Uh, to discuss this program further, and as I said previously, we're joined by Dr. P uh, Patty Prelock and President Joyce Judy, who will be able to go into greater detail about this effort. And with that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Prelock. 
Hello, everyone, and thank you, Governor. I want to begin by thanking you, Governor Scott, for your vision and for the support of the state legislature in making Upskill Vermont a reality. The challenges of the past year have called for creativity and ingenuity. This new program brings both to the people of Vermont. And on behalf of the University of Vermont, I want to express our gratitude to you, Governor Scott, for putting your trust in Vermont's public higher education institutions. I'm standing here at the microphone today because of my role as the Chief Academic Officer at the University of Vermont. But my perspective today comes from the other important role I hold as a pediatric health care provider and researcher. I know firsthand just how critical it is to get more Vermonters working in these three important high demand areas and growing fields that the governor shared. The passion I feel for my career and field of study extends to the possibilities unlocked for everyone in our state through Upskill Vermont. I'm also passionate about UVM's commitment to Vermont. In addition to teaching and conducting groundbreaking research, as the largest university in the state, we have a unique responsibility as Vermont's land-grant institution to really help the entire state of Vermont in good times and in those times which are much more challenging. Upskill Vermont provides an opportunity to demonstrate once again that all of us at UVM take our land-grant mission really seriously. We are working now in the final phases of this pandemic to restart a stronger, smarter economy in our state and to help Vermont citizens go ahead with a potential job promotion or even a career change. But who are we without our partners? UVM could not be happier to develop yet another strong partnership with the Community College of Vermont. Upskill Vermont builds on more than two dozen collaborations that we already have with UVM and CCV through our affiliation agreements. Together, our course offerings can meet the needs of more people than either institution could achieve on its own. And that breadth is represented in the many course offerings related to digital economy, health care, and communities, and leadership and management. Our classes include cybersecurity, bookkeeping, graphic design, integrative health, and dozens of other major topics. I urge every Vermonter to take a look at our course offerings at upskillvermont.org and consider these exciting options totally free. So I now would like to introduce my friend and colleague and partner in Upskill Vermont, Joyce Judy, President of the Community College of Vermont. Please welcome President Judy. Thank you, Patty, and good afternoon. The Community College of Vermont couldn't be more pleased to build on our existing partnerships with UVM. As you heard Patty say, we have for years been working really closely together. It's interesting because 25 years ago, CCV and the University of Vermont, particularly the continuing ed, felt like we were competitors. But we decided 25 years ago that we needed to figure out ways to collaborate to better serve Vermont. And today is just another example of how we are able to come together to better serve Vermonters and Vermont businesses. But this program really is working as a partnership between CCV, UVM, and most importantly, with our local businesses. And it's really to help Vermonters gain the knowledge and skills that they need to prepare them for the jobs that are being created for the future. And as the world changes and as Vermont businesses change and scramble to keep up, education is such a core and such a foundational piece of helping people be prepared and helping businesses thrive in Vermont. What sets this particular program apart and makes it especially valuable to Vermonters is that the University of Vermont's Continuing and Distance Education Department is working really closely with businesses. Businesses from places like King Arthur Flower, the Outdoor Gear Exchange, Brattleboro's Whetstone Station Brewery, to really develop a full continuum of educational opportunities for all their employees and people who aspire to join those companies. 
And CCV's, one of CCV's roles and why we are really partnering with them is because together we can provide that whole continuum. So I say to Vermonters, if you're ready to invest in yourself, this is the year and this is the time to do it. Because of the federal funding and state funding that was approved by both the legislature and with the governor's support, this is a time that makes higher education finally truly affordable in Vermont. Many of these courses and many of these opportunities are free, but step up now because this money won't be here, I can assure you, in the future. So as you think about these things, if you've ever won, if you have been look, over, overlooked for the job that a uh, job promotion that you've wanted for a long time and people have said you need more education, this is the time to do it. If you're looking to help your current employer stay competitive and continue to evolve your skills, now is the time to do it. Or if you simply want to hedge your bets and prepare for the future because you know that your current job may become obsolete because they want a, a person, they need someone with more sophisticated skills, now is really the time to do it. CCV has a proud history of working closely with the University of Vermont. And as Patty mentioned, we have many well-established pathways from CCV to UVM. If you get a degree at CCV, many programs, there's a guaranteed admissions to complete your program at the University of Vermont. And it also includes financial incentives. So it has made a University of Vermont degree incredibly affordable. And this particular program is just one more example how two very different institutions CCV is an open admissions institution. The University of Vermont is a highly um, um, selective in a very positive way um, institution in Vermont. And we are able to really bring our, our resources together and create incredible programs for Vermont. So thank you um, both to um, Patty and also to the governor for helping to, us to be able to all come together bring all of our resources to the table and create really an amazing program. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. And we'll now open it up to questions. And we'll start with folks in the room. You can just jump in in any order you desire. Governor, maybe for Dr. Prelock, uh, how, how many uh, people do we expect to serve with these um, scholarship programs and how many years um, is this money around for? Thank you for the question. I hope as many Vermonters as possible. Um, so I don't think there's a number on it. And we are thinking that the um, program will run about two years. And we will find a way to continue to collaborate with CCV and the legislature if we see that the program is working in the way that we intended it to work. And what's the average cost of one of these classes in any given year? So um, each course, there's two courses that every Vermonter can get for free. And then we have other arrangements with CCV for discounted courses. Um, you know, our courses for Vermonters are, are much more affordable than they are for our out-of-state students, plus any students who take courses in the summer are at a 30% discount rate. But what the Upskill Vermont is doing is allowing two free courses to get people in the door, get them successful, and support them. And that's starting this fall, right? And only this fall? It starts this fall, and Joyce, anything you wanted to add about that? Um, yes, I would say it, it starts this fall, and I also, one of the things that um, we found um, last fall with the um, Workforce 2.0 two, uh, 2 that was approved by the, legislative, uh, the legislature, um, that we had a really um, pretty significant uptick. And so I would say to people that there is a finite amount of money, and so even though the program the funding might last for a year or two. I would say that um, based on uh, previous results that I wouldn't, I wouldn't count on starting next fall. If, if people are interested, now is when you um, need to do it. And in response to your question, if a student was taking a course at CCV, it's about $1,000 a course. Um, that, it's, that's a little higher, but I always say to people, that's what you should plan on in terms of budgeting. Is the, con is the idea that uh, folks are going to be able to acquire the skills they need to advance in their careers solely with those two classes, or that this is your beginning? You know, it really, it, it really varies. 
Um, you know, I can give you a couple of examples of people who we were able to use the, 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 a similar pot of money and a similar funding initiative from last fall. And the number of people, you know, we had a lot of people with um, advanced degrees who now wanted to get into digital marketing or they wanted to, and so a couple of courses did give them that leg up. Or they had, um, you know, they had 50 credits and two more courses almost got them to an associate degree. And then we also had people that this is the first time they put the toe in the water and thought, okay, I can get started and I can do this. So it, it's the whole continuum. But I would, I would be, I want to be really clear. Do I think two college courses, if, you, if you're starting out, that will get you to probably your lifelong goal? No. But it would save, from a CCV perspective, it will save you $2,000. That's a wonderful gift. Put another way to balance question. How many uh, students could you accommodate? Well, that's a really good question because I think what what there's also a lot of different pots of money um, that have come. Um, this program at the University of Vermont is around critical occupations. We also have some additional funding for um, the coming home scholarship. So if students were out of state and they wanted to come, um, they wanted to relocate come back to Vermont and transfer into one of the institutions. There was some funding that's specific for health care. So there's a number of different buckets. And so I don't, I don't mean to avoid your question, but um, there's a lot of pots of money that are available right now. But I will say that the uptick, there's been, we've had a lot of interest. And so, you know, how long will it last? But right now, and, and I will also say we've had some um, philanthropic support. Um, around some particular things, particularly early college, um, to really help. Early college is a program for students who are in high school and want to take a year of college their senior year. Um, it's a great way for students to get started in a college, on a college track. So there's a, right now there's a number of different um, pots of money. If I could just follow up, a month or so ago, mm -hmm. you and the other state college presidents were at Vermont Tech. And yes. You announced a specific high, um, High, high demand, yes. Yeah. Yep. Um, how much up, how much interest have you seen? Do you We've know? seen we have I can't give you the exact numbers. We have seen a lot. And these actually what's really um, you know, nice about this particular our relationship with the University of Vermont is all of this we aren't operating in silos, but rather we're all public in institutions. And how do we really bring all these services to the table? And I feel like in some ways CCV is has the ability to, we are part of the Vermont State Colleges, but we work incredibly closely with the University of Vermont. So it's really, how do we all best serve Vermonters? So CCV has ramped up its efforts in reskilling and upskilling Vermonters. Are there plans to opening, opening the doors for more uh, occupations, more job opportunities, uh, a wider range of occupations? Well, we have a pretty broad spectrum now. And so if there, I would say to people, if there's a particular, if there is a sector that um, is in need of, of coursework and, uh, and a degree program, they should be contacting the University of Vermont, they should be contacting CCV, they should be contacting some higher ed entity because we are always um, developing new programs. So um, we have a pretty broad spectrum now, but we are always very willing to, um, you know, cybersecurity is a, is, it's not a new topic, but it's really escalating and becoming um, quite popular and in demand. And so we're having to step up to the plate in that. So we try to stay really responsive, but um, I would say to anybody that's listening, if you have a need and you aren't seeing it met in Vermont, you should definitely be reaching out to someone because we're always in the market to develop that. Totally. Have you been hearing from more people lately who are considering your career change? Um, and is there something about the pandemic that has kind of spurred that people may be having some time off uh, to really think about those big decisions? That's a great question. And actually, we're seeing a lot of uh, interest in career changing and um, career promotion. I think the pandemic has allowed people to see what can I do and what are the options available. So our continuing education unit um, the relationship they are working with CCV has really helped us think about how we could package our courses for certificates that give people a credential. So maybe you're not taking a whole new major, but you're getting the credentials that you need and the skill set that you need to do a particular job. 
perfect example um, for our, we have a new certificate in um, healthcare coaching. And so with the current issues that have faced us in terms of mental health and um, our focus in Vermont on good, healthy living, exercise, nutrition, we now have people that um, can be trained using a certificate and get a national credential, sit for an exam, and then our health coaches that can really support you. Digital marketing is another one where we have a pretty successful program in um, the continuing education, and it's a very popular one that's on Line that people can take. So we will develop, and our CDE um, group, our continuing distance education group, is pretty creative. And with Joyce's um, efforts as well, we're finding some really nice ways to um, integrate their strengths with our strengths. Thanks. I want to ask about a different, um, the other side of the education spectrum, uh, K-12 schools. Is that okay? Um, the CDC recently put out its guidance for um, the fall. When can we expect Vermont, and is Vermont contemplating mask mandate for unvaccinated children and adults in school context? First of all, I don't know if Dr. Levine wants to answer that first, or maybe uh, Secretary French. Yeah, yeah maybe um, we'll let Secretary French answer that first. Uh, are you on the line, Secretary French? Yes. Did you hear the question? Yes. Uh, yeah. Thank you. We, um, you know, we're pleased. I think with the CDC guidance, it certainly uh, is comprehensive, and I think also importantly, it, um, you know, will provide states flexibility because, as you know, there are a variety of uh, conditions across the country right now. So, uh, we'll review that guidance, um, and we'll be producing something in August for our schools. Uh, again, I think, and I'll ask Dr. Levina to chime in, I think we're still thinking that uh, if any mitigation uh, steps are necessary in schools, they'll be fairly nominal and easy to uh, follow. So did you say August is when we can expect guidance? Yes, we'll, we'll do something in August for schools before the opening of school. And do you anticipate that the current guidance, which is that masking cannot be required, will probably be the status quo in the fall? Well, we'll, we'll uh, make that assessment based on, uh, you know, the conditions in Vermont. Um, so it's, it is a bit of a balancing act. You know, we want to um, wait until we get as close to opening a school as possible. On the other hand, uh, districts need uh, heads up so they can begin to uh, plan and react to that. But again, um, I, our thinking, I don't think that's changed. Um, the CDC guidance is I think comprehensive and useful, but also very familiar to us. All the ideas of layered mitigation are ones we've been employing for the last year. Uh, but we'll make that assessment as close as possible to the, the start of school while at the same time acknowledging that uh, if our mitigation recommendations um, require some, some deliberation on the part of districts, we want to balance that with giving them enough lead time to develop an implementation plan. All right, thank you. <clears throat> Just to build on Secretary French's comments, keep in mind what the CDC came out with is really trying to enable schools across the country to begin to open up, since so many didn't get that close to that. Uh, Vermont was pretty much open, and though we had different levels of uh, in-person versus hybrid versus all uh, remote, uh, for the most part, we did very well as a state getting our kids into school um, and tried to build on that. So the strategies in the CDC's recent publication, as Secretary French said, are very familiar to us, and they're basically everything that's out there that we were aware of before. The thing that we'll be watching most closely between now and when the guidance uh, comes out is exactly what the conditions are on the ground. Um, and if they remain the way they are here, obviously, uh, that's an incredibly a uh, wonderful situation to begin school upon, uh, and we'll be watching what goes on here and around the country to make sure that we have the right layers in place, if you will, because these are all very flexible. Uh, one thing the CDC document refers to in uh, one context, which is student athletes and testing and protocols for competitions, um, it doesn't address in total for the whole document, which is what is the community level of 
uh, transmission of virus uh, going on. But that's something that they imply needs to be taken into account every time you make a decision about are you going to have three-foot spacing, are you going to have masking, are you going to have neither. Uh, so all of that will be taken into account, and we feel it's a little premature here in the beginning of July to begin to really uh, emphatically say uh, what we're going to say a month from now. How concerned are you that the Delta variant will be a complicating factor here? Well, the Delta variant is going to be a complicating factor everywhere because it is going to be the, the number one virus, but again, at the same time, uh, with our level of vaccination and our current levels of cases and uh, how things are progressing in Vermont, I'm not really thinking that uh, as Delta begins to become more and more prevalent in other communities around the country that it's going to have the same impact here. You know, what we're seeing right now, especially in some of these southern and midwestern states, are real clusters and pockets of intense activity of the virus which almost universally correlate with low vaccination rates. Uh, so the goal is, again, that Vermont has such a high vaccination rate, it will protect itself from having any of those kinds of flare-ups in the viral activity and any of the uh, impact on people's health that we're seeing around the country. Um, is there any concern that community transmission will be less of a warning sign, given that Right, like the school population is going to be very different than the out-of-school population, and then it's going to be the largest unvaccinated chunk of people in the state. Right. So, you know, we're having enough testing done right now that I'm pretty confident that we know what's going on, and that we're not underestimating, if you will, uh, what, what viral activity there is in the state. I do understand that in the younger than 12, there may be less symptoms, there may be less awareness of who's infected, who's not infected. But even during the school year previously, uh, we had a pretty good awareness uh, of where infections were and were able to still allow education to go on pretty much unimpeded most of the state, most of the time. So I'm not too concerned about that at this point. Dr. Levine, while you're up there, sorry, what, what do you make of the CDC's uh, statement on the small possible risk of a rare but potentially dangerous neurological condition with the Johnson & Johnson vaccine? Um, you know, when you look at the numbers, it's a very small chance, but what should people feel when they see that? And is this something we should expect over the next few months as we're learning more about these vaccines to see headlines like that? Yeah, so just so the general public has a context, we're talking about an entity called Guillain-Barre syndrome, which is a neurologic uh, illness characterized by weakness, sensation issues, sometimes paralysis. It's occurred in 100 people. And this is, again, testimony to this incredible reporting system that's been stood up for the entire vaccine effort for months and months now, the adverse event reporting system where they look for what's called signals of something that seems to be uh, present a little more than one might have expected, whether it's a patient complaining of weakness, whether it's a physician saying Guillain-Barre syndrome. Uh, these all get recorded. So we're talking uh, about 10 cases per million, to, per 1.3 million to be exact, uh, and a total of 100 cases right now. So this is considered rare and unusual, and, um, but worthy of mention because it did occur and that signal was picked up. I would not want anyone to think that, oh, this is just another reason if I'm an unvaccinated person to not get vaccinated uh, because, again, this is incredibly rare. It has been seen many decades ago uh, after influenza. And uh, it's not like this is the first time it's ever been seen in world history. It's an immune phenomenon uh, with the patient's immune system kind of working against uh, themselves, if you will. Um, very quickly, CDC uh, came out and I think very appropriately said, um, your risk of having an adverse event or some chronic sequela to COVID because you weren't vaccinated and you got COVID is far greater than this kind of risk for this kind of 
vaccine-related entity, which hasn't yet been cause and effect, so we don't actually know definitively that the vaccine caused it, but it has been associated. Um, and I'd like to just repeat what they said, that again, um, this should not be the reason why somebody who hasn't yet gotten around to being vaccinated says, you know, not for me, I'm not gonna take that chance, 10 cases and 1.3 million. Uh, I would think you have a far greater chance with the Delta variant actually of getting the virus because it is so much more readily transmissible and then hopefully you would have a smooth course but you would have a greater probability of having a problem from getting the virus than you would from getting the vaccine. Do you, uh, do, does this syndrome show up pretty quickly? I mean, if you, if you yeah, so, three months ago, were you in the clear? And I'm just asking for a So question. the 100 cases occurred within 42 days of getting the vaccine, but the um, highest number of cases were evident within the first two weeks. So about two weeks after getting the vaccine. Governor, two weeks ago, your administration agreed to, uh, I guess, a two-week reprieve for folks that are in emergency motel housing that would not qualify under the new rules to try to submit paperwork um, showing that they have a disability that would allow them to remain in motel housing. Um, what's going to happen? Does it maybe it expires tomorrow or the next day? But what, yeah, I what, think we've had about 40. I believe I'm right, about 40 of them approved at this point. So let's keep in mind, um, we were talking about a population of about 2,300. Uh, we we're talking about 700 uh, moving away from the program um, because we don't, for one thing, um, it's not sustainable. Uh, secondly, we don't have the motels and hotels available uh, that we'd had before. And we believe that going back to um, more traditional uh, means of, uh, of helping the homeless uh, would be more beneficial uh, to the individual as well, getting the wraparound services and so forth that they need, whether it's addiction issues, mental health issues. And we didn't necessarily have eyes on that when they were in some of the hotels and motels. So we believe this is a better approach. We took this, um, the legislature understood uh, that we didn't have, uh, this wasn't sustainable, we wouldn't be able to continue and uh, asked us to come up with a plan. We did, they approved it. We had all the stakeholders together and here we are today. So I'm going to ask uh, Secretary Smith if he's on the line, if he has any updates or anything that I've missed out of that. Secretary Smith? No, Governor, you, you're, you're fairly right on on that. We had um, 37 clients um, that had uh, applied for the extension of the 14 days. We are still housing uh, 1,488 people um, in our program. Um, we have said before that we have expanded the eligibility criteria from the pre-pandemic era, era um, and, and as a result, we'll be spending about $40 million this year on the hotel motel program. Uh, but we have, uh, as of yesterday afternoon, the uh, Department of Children and Families has dispersed about 536 essential payment checks, that's the $2,500 checks, um, uh, that were available for people who were leaving uh, the program. So, um, you know, we continue to house a, a lot of people who we'll continue to spend a lot of money this year, we'll transition to um, what we had uh, done. We're using navigators to help uh, people find housing. We're using rapid um, restoration funds or rapid resolution funds and other funds like the $2,500. The rapid resolution funds are $8,000 to help, um, help with housing costs. We have rental subsidies. Uh, we have shelter capacity coming up. Uh, we have a governance group that's working for the future on what this program is going to be because I, I want to be clear on this. This program was never designed to end homelessness. It was designed to respond to a public health emergency, namely stay home, stay safe. And the hotel rooms are just not an appropriate uh, place for many of the population. And then, of course, the governor's uh, unprecedented investment in housing, $250 million over three years, but $120 million this year 
for uh, permanent housing for those that are homeless and shelter capacity. It is it is amazing what we're spending here. So, the, to, Peter, I think it was Peter, uh, to answer your question, 37 uh, have taken advantage of that agreement. Out of, out of how many uh, that applied? That's, that's who applied. Everybody that applied got granted. And so they will be able to stay uh, two. The, 84 the 14 days. days. The 14 days. But even though they've been uh, uh, approved as, as having a qualifying disability, they will still have to leave their motel housing tomorrow? No, these, these have not. I'm sorry. These ones that have applied for the extension for 30, uh, 37 people have applied for the extension. I don't have the number of uh, how many have received um, their determination of disability because it was a 14 days, as you remember, it was 14 days to get their paperwork. And as, as you remember, we expanded the disability criteria from that, from uh, having a disability through Social Security or uh, Veterans Affairs to getting a doctor uh, to certify that you do have a disability where you can't work for 90 days. Um, I haven't got the um, the number of people that have been granted that disability, but the, the 37 people applied for that 14-day extension. Peter, I'll get you the number uh, of uh, people that have been granted. Thank you, I have a follow-up question. You mentioned that uh, the older traditional way of um, serving the homeless population might be more beneficial because um, wraparound services could be better delivered that way. Could you elaborate on that? I'm surprised to hear that, that it would be harder to deliver support services and wraparound services um, to homeless Vermonters that well, weren't being we had, Let's say we had a number of homeless shelters, and the reason that we had to come up with a different program was the homeless shelters who had been shut down. Uh, some of the homeless shelters uh, would have professionals there uh, to uh, make sure that their people were checking in, doing uh, what they could to help, and making sure they had food and anything else they might need for substance abuse uh, or um, um, mental health issues. I mean, they were just eyes on the client, so to speak, people coming through the door. Whereas in the hotel motel program, um, they were pretty much on their own. And uh, so they weren't as visible. There weren't uh, as many people visiting them and seeing what their challenges were or are and uh, getting the help they needed. So case managers like couldn't go to the hotel? They, they just weren't, it wasn't the same. You know, the case managers uh, didn't necessarily follow them into homeless shelters. It was the people that were running the homeless shelters uh, that were the case managers in some respects uh, and then brought in uh, people uh, to help out professionals, to help out in, in those uh, in those cases of uh, some of the, uh, again, challenges that they were experiencing. So they, they were more, I mean, there were more of them as well, 2,300, I think, uh, we, the homeless population at one time was maybe 400, uh, I may be off on that number, uh, pre-pandemic. Um, so this, uh, this uh, issue, you know, grew uh, as well. So. Again, getting back to opening up the, the homeless shelters, uh, making sure that we're there to help and, and get those wraparound services that they desperately need. So you heard this from folks servicing homeless from Montreal. I've heard this from, from the Agency of Human Services, Department of Children and Families. Governor, could you uh, tell us what your expectations and hopes are for the state broadband board and your decision to appoint the person who challenged you in the general election in 2018 to lead it. Yeah. Well, as you might remember, um, we had a lot of discussions uh, two, three years ago during that campaign, and they're political in nature. I mean, that's what they're all about. Um, but one of, the, one of the issues we did not uh, debate, uh, and we agreed on, was the need for broadband. And, uh, and I think uh, it was just really about how we pay for it. I thought uh, that we needed the federal uh, government to be involved, more of an REA approach. Uh, and in the end, that's off the table. We have uh, the resources we now need um, to implement. 
but uh, with the experience of Christine uh, as a CEO uh, of a utility company, uh, and since then working with some of the uh, some of the broadband uh, uh, groups in the Northeast Kingdom, I can't think of a better person uh, to put in that position to get this accomplished. Uh, I wanted someone who could hit the ground running. Uh, we have uh, we have the resources to do so. Uh, we just need the drive uh, and energy and the expertise uh, to get it done. And uh, and I really believe uh, she's the right person at the right time to accomplish this. And uh, so after any election, I try and put everything aside and then do what I think is right for Vermont. Governor, getting back to housing for a second, if my calendar is correct, I think this week the eviction moratorium Expires is is ours um, linked to the extension at the, from the CDC at the federal level, or is ours expiring this week? Ours was uh, linked to the to the state um, state legislature it had said 30 days after the emergency order expired, uh, thus it did the eviction. Um, and, and what, what need is there? I mean, yeah, I, I don't know what to expect in some uh, some um, instances. I know that uh, the courts um, will now take control in some respects. Uh, they will be the ones uh, to determine whether someone should be evicted or there's uh, due cause to be evicted. So I, I don't know. I haven't heard much. Um, so uh, my hope is uh, that there won't be that many uh, that will have to go into the judicial branch, but it's up to them at this point. I have faith in them, but the courts are backed up as well, so it may be a little bit uh, before those cases are heard. All right, I need to move to the phones now. And folks, if you have another follow-up question in the room, just uh, shoot can, me a can I just Can I just add uh, just a couple of things? One, uh, okay. Stuart, you had asked about the how many students can be accommodated. I think, I think we're going to have to figure out how what the demand is in what areas um, and I just wanted to expand on that too because not only is it uh, for cybersecurity and, and some of the digital marketing and so forth and so on and, uh, but it's for uh, trade the trades as well so apprenticeships think about uh, electrical uh, trades or plumbing uh, heating ventilating as well so there are opportunities there so it's widespread and we want uh, people to make sure that they know all the opportunities that are out there because this really is a could be a turning point in their lives. All right, we'll go to Wilson Ring, the Associated Press. Uh, hi, good morning, everybody. Um, a, a real quick follow up on the Delta question, um, Dr. Levine. Do you know if the the cases, however, the increase in cases here, however small? Are, are those coming up Delta, do you know? And can Vermont ever be truly safe as long as uh, Delta is out there? And who knows what other variants that could come along afterwards? Yeah, so we have a whole bunch of recent cases that we're doing whole genome sequencing on. I don't have those results for you right now. Um, you know, we were only seeing a few cases a day a week ago. Now we're seeing, you know, somewhere in the eight case a day range, so we have more cases to sequence, and I'll get you those results when we have them. Unlike doing a COVID test, sequencing can be a week-long process, so it's not an immediate turnaround. With regard to the, um, but although, but I have to say that, you know, I would still not be surprised to see more Delta making up as, as a percentage uh, of those cases. Um, <clears throat> again, Delta is something that is still COVID. It's still the coronavirus. Uh, it is more readily transmissible. So you would expect it to increase slightly, but at the same time, we're not going to be looking at Delta that much differently than we looked at coronavirus all along the way. So it shouldn't markedly change any of the approach and that includes the approach to vaccine, which is why we're maintaining a very, very high level of availability of vaccine and trying to connect as many Vermonters with it, because that is still the number one 
way to, war to not have to worry about Delta or any future variant. The less a person can actually get infected with the virus, transmit it to others, allow the virus to mutate because it's being transmitted actively, that's the way we win this game with uh, the coronavirus or any virus for that matter. So again, same kind of strategy uh, that we've been using all along uh, and no let up on the intensity of that strategy. Okay, thank you very much. I, I don't want to lose um, our perspective on this either. It just is a reminder. Seven months ago, seven months ago, we had just started vaccinating uh, Vermonters and those across the, the country. Um, eight months ago, we didn't have anyone vaccinated. So we were 100% vulnerable in some respects. Now we have 82.8% uh, who are vaccinated. So the vast majority of them are protected right now. 82.8% more than eight months ago. So we have seven, roughly 17% left to go. Out of the 17%, I would venture, and I don't have uh, the information on this, but I would venture that some of them have uh, had COVID. So they have built up some sort of um, immunity, natural immunity, I would think. We don't know how long that will last, but of some sort. So. We're talking about a fairly small number here in this state, and we have a lot to be, again, be proud of um, for what we've done, and we're not stopping yet. I mean, again, it was just a, a few short weeks ago that we hit 80%, and now we're three, three points ahead of that, and we're going to continue uh, to offer vaccinations to Vermonters. So we, this is in our control. Uh, we, can, we can do this if we get more people vaccinated, we can put this problem to bed. Okay, thank you very much. Lisa Loomis, The Valley Reporter. Good afternoon. My question is about the Department of Motor Vehicles. We've been hearing from readers who are unable to make timely appointments at DMV, and I know that some offices are reopening. Is there any update on the Department of Motor Vehicles? Lisa, I don't know if we have anyone on today. Um, no. Um, we'll get someone uh, to contact you. Um, I, we did uh, talk about opening up more of the offices, uh, some of the uh, smaller hybrid um, offices, and that will take a little bit of the load off from uh, some of the larger uh, um, operations that we have. Um, so I'm in hopes uh, that we can do that as well. Uh, we're getting through some of the backlog that was created because a lot of folks uh, did so by mail, and uh, that's you know been beneficial. Uh, but uh, we were a little overwhelmed at one point with that, but we're catching up. So uh, for those who can, you should do it online. You should do it by mail. And uh, for those who want to go in person, um, you can search out a bit too, because we're opening up other offices. Uh, if you live in between, uh, let's say Montpelier uh, and uh, uh, St. Jay or St. Albans, you might want to consider going to one of those uh, facilities, but they're not open every day as a reminder. I went back to what their uh, hours were uh, pre-pandemic. Great, thank you very much. Greg Lamoureux, the County Courier. Good afternoon, Governor. Uh, I think this would be a question for Dr. Levine. Uh, you've, you've talked several times about the possibility in the future of uh, booster shots. If someone wants a booster shot, uh, is it available from the state? Uh, can somebody go to one of these clinics and get a booster shot, uh, or would they be denied? They would probably be denied. <laughs> Because again, we don't have evidence base that getting a booster at this point in time is the advisable path. One thing you want to do when you uh, start letting people sort of experiment, if you will, whether it be get a booster, whether it be get a different vaccine than the one that they started with, um, you run the risk of them getting a sense of false reassuredness that what they've done is the icing on the cake and now they're invincible. 
Uh, and the reality is we really don't know that. So I'd much rather people do things like that when the evidence points to doing it. Um, and that's a, a challenge for some people, I think, because everybody wants to be as protected as possible. And they're hearing all the news reports about the Delta variant spreading from here to there and everywhere else. But the bottom line is it doesn't mean that uh, another action is indicated. If they've already gotten fully vaccinated with the vaccine that they have, um, that is fine. And in fact, federal officials just met literally yesterday and again came to that same conclusion. So at this point in time, uh, we shouldn't veer from that conclusion. So, so does the state of Vermont have a system if, if someone were to walk up and say, I want a shot, uh, does the state of Vermont have a system on site to know if they've already been vaccinated based on their name and, and date of birth? How does that work? That, yes, I mean, they can, the vaccine registry can be checked um, to see if uh, that person has been vaccinated. Uh, my sense is that, you know, the person would usually be coming up asking for a booster, so they would probably be able to tell them what they've already gotten. But is that is that registry checked as a as a rule, or do you, I'm just curious from a, a logistical point of view, do, do is that really what happens, or or uh, do health officials just uh, say, okay, you know? Put your name here, and uh, we'll get you a shot. It's a good question. You know, I, I don't know from the standpoint of a pharmacist or uh, one of our healthcare partners working in one of these clinics uh, if they would actually take the trouble to check. Because if someone's coming to present for their first dose of vaccine, I think they would assume that they're presenting for their first dose of vaccine. Okay. Uh, that's it for me. Thank you. Tim McQuiston, Vermont Business Magazine. Hey, good afternoon. I have a question for um, Dr. Prelock and or um, President Judy about the um, the program. And, and I'm wondering what, I, I want to be clear on the, the amount of money. Is it one pot? Is UVM getting some and CCE getting some? And then I have a follow-up question also. <clears throat> Um, yes, the University of Vermont received a million dollars to support the Upscale Vermont program, and President Judy can answer for CCB. Yes, and um, the Vermont State College has received funding from in a lot of different sources. Um, so under the um, the critical occupations spread out among the four institutions, I believe it's four point five million. So there's a number of different um, pots of money. Um, related to that, is the, is the 4.5 including the 1 million that UVM got? No, that's a separate, separate okay. appropriation. There's money that came directly to the Vermont State Colleges, money that came to the University of Vermont, and what we're presenting today is that we're really working together to try and make sure that Vermonters who need the skills and whatever program they want. It's not that, okay, you go to UVM or you go to CCV or you go to another Vermont State Colleges and that's the end of the line, but rather we're trying to figure, we're trying to work really closely together so that there's a continuum of opportunities. And I think earlier a question about, you know, if I was interested in this particular sector, you should, you should, a person should look across the, all the public institutions in Vermont and my hunch is that you would find something that would um, fit the bill. Right, and I just so, want, wanted to add that um, we have several relationships that are, have already been started with CCV and Vermont Technical College that we've been working on for the last several years. So say I wanted to, say I had a bachelor's degree and I wanted to um, um, change careers to a more technical one, how, how would I start this process? Well, there's a number of different options, and I think one of the things that um, the University of Vermont's continuing education um, program is offering um, some career workshops that are being offered um, in the month of August. If at, at, um, 
if you came to CCD directly, we have, um, as I think most people know, we have 12 locations throughout the state. We also have a very strong online component. We have coordinators that are academic advisors that serve and support people. And we serve a lot of adults. As you know, CCD's average age is 28. People come to us and with all kinds of questions. They've been in the military. Now they want to transition into civilian life. And I'm interested in digital technology, or I'm interested in plumbing and heating, where should we go? And, you know, we might direct them to Vermont Tech's apprenticeship program that they have with the Department of Labor. Or if they were looking for, you know, health coaching, it might go to the University of Vermont. It's really trying to match people's interests. And I think every one of our schools has people that can help um, greet people and figure out where is it best for them to start. And I, I know, um, President Judy, that CCB is open enrollment, but the other colleges uh, don't necessarily. If I was looking for a UVM course, would it have to be accepted like a, any other UVM student would be? Um, that's a good question. We actually have opportunities for people who are not of specific majors and minors. So we have a non-degree program, so you can enroll up to several courses um, as a non-degree student to determine what your pattern is. We're also working on a relationship with CCV to potentially do some co-enrollment where a student could be at CCV and UVM, so we're working on that plan. But no, you can... Um, really enroll in a program through our continuing and distance education as a non-degree student. Okay, thank you. Ann Wallace Allen, seven days. Hi, can you hear me? We can. Um, Governor, last week I had asked you about the Canadian border. You said you were going to um, find out if there was any movement on it, other than some movement by Chuck Schumer, I guess, to um, get it open on this side. Were you able to find out anything more? No, I, I was hoping uh, that I would be able to ask that question on today's call with the White House, but uh, uh, unbeknownst to me, they've gone to every other week, and uh, at that point I didn't know. Uh, that they had gone to the uh, next week on Tuesday. So I intend to bring that up again next week. Uh, but I um, did talk with our uh, Senator Leahy about this, uh, and he's offered whatever support he can give. Uh, obviously, we have mutual interests, and uh, we'll continue to advocate for this. So, um, but, I, but I won't have that opportunity with the uh, White House officials, I don't believe, until next week. All right. Thanks so much. That'll do it for me. Thanks. Tom Davis, Compass Vermont. Hi, thanks, Jason. Uh, Governor, sort of a follow-up to that. Uh, I was curious, Prime Minister Trudeau has been pretty emphatic about the fact that even as uh, the border restrictions are loosened, that uh, unvaccinated Americans, uh, which obviously includes Vermonters, uh, are not going to be welcome for quite some time. Uh, um, the question I have is, have you heard anything about what kind of requirements the Canadian government is going to kind of have in place for particularly Vermonters who uh, want to go to Canada and prove they're vaccinated once the restrictions are lifted? Yeah, I have not, uh, Tom, heard what that would look like. Um, I, I'm not opposed uh, to the idea on either side uh, because I think it just makes makes sense. But, um, but I don't know how uh, that would be. I think they're having some trouble with their program, and I don't know that we, our program um, is, uh, is maybe as far along as theirs. So uh, I know that we have uh, cards available, and we might have to attest to that, but, uh, uh, but the cards are just uh, simply uh, vaccination cards you receive after being vaccinated here in the States. So they could be replicated, I'm sure, and there could be, you know, some fraud, I would imagine. So I don't know what it would look like, but um, but that will be one of my questions as well. Okay, thank you. Uh, second question is, um, the new report card came out on financial literacy in America. Vermont's grade in that area uh, rose from a D to a C. Uh, but it seems like there's a bit of work that still needs to be done 
to improve financial literacy across the country, but obviously in Vermont as well. Are there specific programs that Vermont's looking at enhancing to have that happen? I am not aware. I know I worked with the treasurer on this when I was lieutenant governor. I think that is essential that the Vermonters understand how money works and what they can do to protect themselves in a lot of regard. But maybe Secretary French would have more on this if he's on. Could you repeat the question, Governor? It was about, the question was about financial literacy and our grade increase from a D to a C. And just wondering, so we still have some room to go and wondered, Tom was wondering if there was any plans, any programs that we might have that would get us higher on the scale. Yeah, I don't know about higher, but I think you alluded to what has been a pretty, is a very successful program. It was a partnership with the treasurer's office and Champlain College. So I think we have a really solid online and module sort of based curriculum out there for students to use. You know, like a lot of these data that we're seeing these days, I'm not sure to what extent that's a function of, you know, the COVID environment or what have you. But I would suspect we need to do more on leveraging remote learning technology in particular to make sure that the curriculum, which is really, really robust, is better distributed across the state. Is there, Secretary, is there any, is there, is there any program at the public education level when people are still in secondary school that would at least prepare them to want to continue on to these types of programs? Yeah, I think, you know, increasingly there's a lot of, in particular, online learning options for students in these areas. And there are several national level curriculum in this area in particular. But again, it's a question of communications often and then figuring out how to fit it into the curriculum. There's a lot of pressure, as you know, on school day to teach lots of different subjects. So this is obviously a fairly critical one for both education and broader societal success. So it needs to be a priority in the system. But, you know, again, I feel, I feel pretty comfortable that there, it's not a question of lack of curriculum. I think the curriculum is there. It's really a question of communication and, you know, providing the infrastructure so students can access the curriculum. Hey, Tom, we do have our commissioner of the Department of Financial Regulation here. Maybe I'll ask Commissioner Pichak as well as Joyce Judy. I think CCD might have some courses that might help out. Yeah, thank you, Governor, and thank you, Tom. So you're absolutely right. I mean, it's critical financial literacy for Vermonters. It's great to see that the score went up. There's certainly areas you can point to where Vermonters do very well relating to financial matters, whether it's Vermonters' average credit score, whether it's amount of savings and things of that nature. But there's also issues relating to retirement savings, emergency funds as well that we see definitely throughout um, throughout Vermont. So it's a critical issue. Our department before the pandemic often partnered with the treasurer's office with other, uh, you know, regional um, uh, enterprises and projects to get financial literacy out uh, into the community to learn about financing insurance, um, to learn about investments, uh, sort of, you know, on the ground, uh, you know, event by event. And that always proved to be very successful and people were very interested. And we've tried to find ways to leverage that as well through uh, online resources. But, um, you know, I think people are really interested in learning it. And we certainly encourage our industry also to emphasize uh, consumer education as well uh, to their customers. Very good. Thank you very much, uh, all of you. For your I was just going to offer one other option. Um, the Community College of Vermont partners with the New England Federal Credit Union, um, and they offer a module in a course that we call Introduction to College and Careers, which is a free course to high school sophomores, um, really targeted helping to prepare them for the future. And I will tell you that that module, over and over and over again, is the most popular module in that course. And it serves, we generally serve between 500 and 800 high school sophomores a year with um, that particular course. Thank you. It sounds like there's some resources that people just need to know more about so that they can access them. I appreciate it. Chris Roy, Newport Daily Express. 
Yes, good afternoon. Uh, we're here in, uh, nationwide here in Vermont that summer camps programs are being hit with uh, COVID outbreaks. And are there any uh, precautions that these summer programs in general should be taken with kids, either uh, day camps or overnight camps? Yeah, I'm not hearing that we have an issue here in Vermont, um, but uh, we did put some guidelines in place uh, when we announced the, the program. So I don't believe that we're having an issue here in Vermont, Chris, unless you have heard different. Um, that's, that's what I've heard, but I haven't had time to research it yet. I'm going to let Dr. Levine answer. Were you, were, you, were you worried about camps having to close because of infection? Well, either having to close or what precautions that programs are taken yeah. um, now that we're in the middle of summer here um, to protect kids at these different uh, programs, whether it's a day program or a week-long program. Yeah, so, you know, we one thing we have uh, eyes on is uh, over a dozen camps have... Um, used uh, testing protocols for students on their arrival. And we've seen the results of hundreds and hundreds of tests that were performed, and not one of them was positive. Uh, so these camps, I think, felt pretty good about the fact that they could start out their camp experience with a pretty much uninfected uh, group of uh, kids who are coming to, sometimes coming to Vermont from elsewhere, sometimes uh, already living in Vermont. There also was guidance provided to all of the camps regarding different mitigation strategies that they could utilize and uh, recommendations for when masking would be appropriate or not. So I, I think they all started out on a pretty solid foundation and I've not heard of any uh, specific cases or instances where a camp has uh, had its operations uh, jeopardized at this point. Okay, thank you. Guy Page, Vermont Daily Chronicle. Um, hello, Governor. Uh, President Biden has announced plans to send vaccine educators door to door in areas of low vaccination. Will Vermont be participating in that? And if so, where? You know, we did a little bit of that in some respects in the Northeast Kingdom when we had EMTs going uh, right to your doorstep for those who couldn't make it in. I don't, I don't know if we have plans for doing that uh, in the future. Uh, but if anyone, you know, it might be part of uh, of our uh, strategy in the future if there are folks out there that uh, that would like to uh, have. Uh, be vaccinated, uh, and we need to come to them. We we may do that, but uh, but it won't be, you know, cold calling, uh, knock on the door type of approach. Oh, okay. So you you won't be doing the, hello, we're here, and we'd like to talk to you about vaccination. You no, I that. mean we we want to educate as much as possible. Uh, we want people to do the right thing, uh, but we're not going to pressure them in that in that manner. Okay. A uh, question for uh, you or Secretary French. Uh, can you tell me um, how many students, as far as you know so far, uh, will be homeschooled this fall, what the kind of early count is? I, d I don't know. Maybe Secretary French knows. No, uh, we don't have a, a count yet, uh, Guy, but um, I will have those numbers as we get closer to the start of the school year. Um, typically, we don't see a significant uptick in the application process till around August 1st at any rate. So I'm sure many folks, uh, as you know, were interested in homeschooling last year as a result of the COVID pandemic. Yeah. Uh, so I think many, many families were still probably watching that uh, and trying to assess what the conditions will be like in the fall. But I'll have an update on those numbers as we get closer to the start of the school year. Right. Thank you very much. Riley Robinson, BT Digger. Hi, good afternoon. I have a question about genomic sequencing. Um, so back to variants. I'm wondering what percentage of COVID tests in Vermont are being sequenced? Um, how, like, how good is the data on that? Yeah, so I don't have a recent number for you. Um, some of it has to do with 
the integrity of the specimen, if you will, that it can be sequenced, that we have a specimen that's valid to work with. Others have to do with the fact that they were done in our lab, and our lab is now doing sequencing, or at the UVM lab, which is also doing sequencing. Some are done uh, with our contract with the Broad Institute in Boston, and that's uh, more random, if you will. So um, probably next week I can get you the number of um, recent positive tests that have been sequenced. It's going to be relatively high because, again, we have a relatively low number of positive tests, so we can do a higher percentage of them. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. We'll see you again next Tuesday.